Well, at least I got two of you here. So that's a pretty positive start. All right. So obviously this is not the most ideal situation in the world, um, especially for a lab based class. So needless to say, we're not going to be doing any more kind of, I guess, hands on labs in class since nothing is going to be, you know, in person anymore. So there's going to be a few changes that are going to happen. So obviously, like the in class labs aren't going to happen anymore. Um, so you'll just primarily be responsible for I guess kind of just understanding the material as opposed to having to actually, I guess, do it or perform it in class. Um, I'm going to turn your exam into an online one. So what I'll do actually with this is I'm going to, you know, keep it all the same material. So it'll, it'll all be lower extremity spine, all that. Um, but I will give you multiple attempts at it since it's going to be, you know, completely different from what we've been doing. And since we're not going to be doing really a lot of the hands-on stuff we had. So there's that. But yeah, as of right now, we're on unit five. So the only thing you have really do, or the only two things you have do, and that's not for two more weeks, are your rough draft and your um, assignment and then the discussion. So for the discussion here, there's two bits here. You need to pick one of these. So sports that are most susceptible to ACL injuries and how can we prevent these from occurring? And why is surgery only indicated for, only usually indicated for ACL injuries and why not any of the others? So we'll be covering that um, probably on Wednesday. For your knee homework, it's just going to be this here. Oh, that shouldn't be there. But we'll be going over all this here, um, both today and uh, on Wednesday. All right, first thing I want to do is to kind of do an overview of where we're at. <clears throat> so <clears throat> one of the things I'm still finding that um, we're struggling with is the whole notion of our planes and axes of movement. So I wanted to kind of go over that with you guys first. <clears throat> All right, so your three cardinal planes of movement as the PowerPoint kind of suggests there, frontal, sagittal, and transverse. Remember that your axis is always perpendicular. So that means that if I have my axis as being the transverse plane here, perpendicular means that it runs into a right angle to it. So for the sagittal plane, perpendicular to that is going left and right or medial lateral. For the frontal plane, it's going anterior posterior. And for the transverse plane, it goes vertical. So that's just all it is, is just making a right angle out of the plane there. And that's how you tell what your, um, what your axis is. Or I guess that's what I mean by saying perpendicular to that. So for your frontal plane, since your frontal plane cuts you into a front and back, you're always going to have the anterior-posterior axis. 
for the sagittal plane, medial lateral. And for the transverse, you have the longitudinal, longitudinal. And you can call it any of those things. Longitudinal, superior, inferior, vertical. All those mean the same thing. Now the movements that occur for the frontal plane, this is our ab adduction. For sagittal, it's going to be flexion extension. For transverse, it's going to be rotation. So that's our primary movements for all these. There are some exceptions with it, you know, obviously, um, but for the most part, this is how everything goes. So hopefully just seeing it in this kind of simplified view can really help um, just kind of clarify a lot of that for you here. Now, in terms of what the actual movements are that we need to know, with flexion, in general, this is going to create an acute joint angle. So, <clears throat> if I were to take, say, my, you know, my arm and have it straight out in extension, so just straight away, and then I flex my elbow like I'm doing a bicep curl, that creates an acute angle between my forearm and my bicep. So flexion is most always going to be concentric contractions. Extension is going to be the opposite, so it's going to create an obtuse joint angle. So acute is less than 90 degrees. Extension is going to have a, a greater than 90 degree movement. Abduction just goes away from midline. Adduction comes back to midline. So inversion, eversion, plantar flexion, dor plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, these are all just foot and ankle movements. So we'll cover those when we get into that. Pronation, supination, the active movements in the forearm, static position in the foot and ankle. So I'll explain that more when we get to the foot and ankle. But what this just means is when you pronate or supinate, you are actually moving the forearm. So pronation, I'm turning my palm face down. Supination, I turn my palm face up. When I look at pronation and supination in the foot and ankle, it's just the static position. So if my ankles bow inward towards each other, that would be a pronated foot. If my ankles go away from each other where they're rounded off towards the outside, that would be a supinated ankle but you don't move the ankle for pronation supination. It's just how you're positioned when you're just standing there. And then internal or medial rotation rotates toward the midline external or lateral rotation rotates away from midline. Now, 
Now, granted, I'm, I'm definitely making these a big oversimplification, but uh, still, this will really help, I think, with just clarifying a lot of these initial concepts we just have to become more kind of comfortable with here. Do either of you two right now have any questions on the basic movement? So the planes of movement, axes of rotation, or the naming the movements of the joints? No, not right now. All right. Um, this is going, was going to be what we're going to be using for measuring the spine, but we aren't going to be doing that anymore. Um, so don't worry about that. What I'm hoping to be able to do is to get you guys goniometers to kind of have. Um, now, I don't know if you guys, are you guys on, well, back around campus, or did you guys just go home? No, I have to stay. So I'm currently at the <clears throat> schooling apartments. Okay. Gabby, are you here or in Texas? All right. Okay, so let's go back into the knee here. All right, so for the knee, four bones, only three of which are important. Say that again. Okay. Do what? Say that again. So you have four bones in the knee. Only three of them are important. So femur, patella, tibia. Those are the three important ones. Fibula, not important. The only thing the fibula does for us is it has an attachment site here for your LCL. That's it. Your fibula is non-weight bearing. So no weight goes on the fibula. What that means is that if you stand up, your fibula has absolutely nothing that is compressing it. All of the weight of your body for your legs goes on your tibia. So nothing on the fibula. If you were to completely break your fibula like in half, it would hurt really bad, but theoretically you could still walk because your fibula does nothing for you in terms of weight bearing. So that's why I say it's not important. The patella is free floating. So if you ever feel your kneecap, you can move that back and forth. It just floats there. It does that so that it allows more range of motion. The patella is attached to the tibia and the femur in two ways. So at the bottom, you have a patella ligament. At the top is a patella tendon. Your quads are what give you the patella tendon and your patella ligament is just a ligament by itself. All right, in terms of the actual soft tissue ligaments you'll need to know, MCL, LCL, ACL, PCL. MCL and LCL are your collateral ligaments, so medial and lateral collateral ligaments. <clears throat> now, your fibula is always lateral. Your tibia is always medial. This will be true when we talk about the foot and ankle as well, because we'll see how that becomes kind of important too. Um, but your ankles are actually the ends of your tibia and fibula. 
So the medial ankle bone you have is your tibia. The lateral ankle bone you have is your fibula. This here is your LCL. So you see how it attaches right to the top of the fibula. That's the only important thing that the fibula does for the knee. That's it. Nothing else. Absolutely nothing else. This here is your MCL. And this here is your ACL. And that there is your PCL. So collateral ligaments prevent you from going left and right. So your MCL and LCL stop your knee from going this way or this way. Your ACL and PCL are cruciate ligaments. Cruciate means cross. So you see how they form a cross here. ACL ends in the front. So PCL ends in the back. These prevent anterior and posterior movement. So they prevent you from going that way and that way. The majority of ACL injuries are non-contact injuries. While you can't injure an ACL if you like get hit in the side of the, le the knee, most likely if you injure your ACL, it's because you have medially rotated. So you've done medial rotation with a fixed foot your foot was stuck on the ground, and then you turned inward. That's usually what's going to, going to injure your ACL. So MCL, LCL, left and right, so prevents you from going left or right. ACL, PCL, anterior and posterior, prevents you from going front and back. Your menisci or your meniscus are these two half moon shaped pieces of cartilage that sit on top of the tibia. So they sit right on the top of the tibia here. What these are going to be doing are these four things here. So joint stability, so it ha helps same way like your labrum would help with the shoulder and the, and the hip. Shock absorption, so it acts as a, a, a cartilage pad for you there. It does help with proprioception, so it does have Golgi tendon organs on it, which will tell you kind of where your body's positioned in space. And then this transfer load, what this means is that this is going to help dissipate the energy or the load you have when you stand up. If you were to, like, say, jump and land on your feet, you're going to be landing with a greater force than what your body weight. You would land at the force of your body weight times gravity, which by itself would kind of, you know, do a lot of damage to your legs. But what, because you have these menisci here, what they do is they actually act as a way to dissipate a lot of that energy. So really the whole reason why you can jump and not break your legs every time you jump is pretty much exclusively because of the meniscus. Most often, if you injure it, you're going to injure the medial meniscus because it's going to be higher up. So you notice this is a little bit lower than that. So usually that's going to be the one that's injured. There's a very poor blood supply to it. So just like all cartilage, there's very little blood supply that goes to it. If you injure it, most likely you need surgery. But the main thing you should know about the meniscus are these here. Shock absorption and really your joint stability. Those are the main things with the meniscus. Don't worry so much about all this. Now, like I was telling you guys a couple weeks ago, with the muscles you have in your legs, they will move your knee in the direction that the muscle is located. So 
these are your quad muscles. Your quads, as you know, are on the front of your leg. So they are going to bring your knee forward into extension. You have four quad muscles. Your vastus muscles are deep. Your rectus muscle is on top. So vastus medialis is on the medial side. If you were to flex your knee, or I'm sorry, extend your knee and make a contraction with your quads, this would be the teardrop you would see like near the bottom middle of your, um, or I guess the top middle of your knee. Your vastus lateralis is going to be the outside of your leg there. Vastus intermedius is deep, you can't see that. So that's underneath your rectus femoris. And rectus femoris is right in the middle. All of these are going to make the hip flex and knee extend. These are all forward motions. And they all attach at the eight is. So anterior, inferior, iliac spine. So here's your ilium right here. This whole big thing here is your iliac spine. So the inferior portion is the bottom portion. So that's where that ends. This would be your ACIS or your anterior superior iliac spine, which is goes to the top. I'm not so worried that you know origin insertion. I'm more worried that you know the actions here, okay? So just remember, these are in front, so they are going to do forward motion. And forward motion is hip flexion, knee extension. If you get confused, just try to contract those muscles and, what, and figure out what direction your leg has to move to make those contract. That's going to go a long way for you in deciding what actual muscle action they have, just because they have to contract in really just one way. You're not going to get those to contract if you say bend your knee. If you extend your knee, they're going to contract. But if you do even the wrong motion, you know it's wrong because they're not going to contract. So quads in front, forward motion of the leg. Hamstrings are in back. You have three hamstring muscles and they're grouped into two sides. So your semi muscles are medial. Your biceps is lateral. So these here, are your semis, semimembranosus, semitendinosus. The way you can remember it, there's more M's in those than there are here. So because there's more M's, they are medial. Biceps is lateral. Now, because your hamstrings are on the back of your leg, they're going to move your leg backwards. So that is your hip extension and knee flexion. Both of those are backward movements. And again, if you contract your hamstrings, you have to flex your knee or you have to extend your hip. You can't contract your hamstrings if your knee is extended. You can't contract your hamstrings if your hip is flexed. So just to be able to get those to work, you have to be able to contract or you have to have those um, move your leg backwards.
All right, Q angle, that just stands for quadriceps angle. What this is going to measure is how far of a deviation you have from your ACIS to your patella. And that forms your Q angle. Another way to think about this is how wide your hips are. And why this matters is the wider your hips, the less stable your knee. This is why it's important. This is why females are two times more likely than males to sprain their ACL. So women have a much greater chance to tear their ACL than men do because women have wider hips. But the wider this angle, so the bigger this angle is, or the wider set your hips are, the less stable your knee is. That's really what you have to know about that. So Q angle that's big equals bad knee. Q angle that's small, good knee. All right, this screw home mechanism here, I'm just, I'm just going to delete that so it's. What this says is this tells us how our knee rotates. So because our knee is a modified hinge joint, it doesn't lock into place from the bones. Instead of like say with the elbow where you have the olecranon that holds the humerus straight into place. You have a bony connection there. With the knee, your patella is free floating, so there is no bony connection. Because there's no bony connection, you can actually move your, or rotate your knee slightly. Now, you'll never feel it, like you really can't rotate it on your own but you rotate it when you reach your end range of motion. So when you extend your knee full all the way, so terminal extension, that means you lock your knee out. When you lock your knee out, your femur rotates internally. So here's your femur, here's your tibia. This is a posterior view. So in full extension, your femur moves inward or rotates medially, your tibia will rotate laterally. And that locks it into place. As soon as you start to bend your knee, or as soon as you start to flex your knee, this reverses. So for extension, femur has internal rotation, tibia has external rotation. For flexion, femur has external rotation, tibia has internal rotation. What the moral of the story here is, is that your knee rotates just so that it can lock into place when you fully extend it, and then also to allow it to flex. So the screw home mechanism just really says that your knee can rotate. 
and it has to rotate to maintain more stability. Now, this convex concave rule, this is a, an arthrokinematic concept here. So, remember, arthro is joint surface, which you can't see. So, this is telling us what's happening inside the knee that we can't see. If we look back at the knee here, you see that with the femur, you have these convex knobs at the bottom here. And with the tibia, you have these concave holes here where they fit in. So it's just puzzle pieces. The convex femur fits into the concave fibula, or tibia, sorry. So that's just how they work. They're just puzzle pieces fitting into each other. Now, what happens here is this convex concave rule is saying how or which bone moves when I do what. So, if you have a convex movement, remember that your femur is convex, your tibia is concave. So convex moving, femur moves, tibia does not. In a concave movement, tibia moves, femur does not. How we do that? If your foot is on the ground, you have a convex movement. If your foot is in the air, you have a concave movement. Okay? Convex, foot on ground, concave, Foot in air. So if you go to get out of your chair, you have to put your feet on the ground, your knees are bent at a 90 degree angle roughly, and you stand up and your tibia or your lower leg stays fixed. It doesn't move. Your femur moves. So when you're extending your knee, you're moving just your femur there. If you were to just kick your knee out or your leg out into full extension with your foot off the ground, your femur doesn't move, your tibia does. So that's just how you tell the difference between convex and concave. Concave, your foot's in the air. Convex, your foot's on the ground. Convex, the femur moves. Concave, the tibia moves. and just your normal ranges of motion here. Um, so knee flexion should have 140 degrees, knee extension zero. Q angle, male's about 14 degrees, female's about 17 degrees. Again, with the Q angle, that's going to just tell us or talk to us about knee stability. You don't measure internal or external rotation of the knee. Those don't get measured. All right, how are you guys feeling about the knee so far? Pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. Okay. Does it help by me telling you that the position or the location of your muscles tells you which direction they move? Yes. Yes. Okay.
All right, so one more time with our planes here. So now, granted, um, these um, this is all going to be like in this recording here. So um, if you go back to the Zoom tab and you go to Cloud Recordings, this will show up after we're done here. So you'll always have access to this. So just keep that in mind. But going back here, remember that your plane the movement goes through the plane. Our, say frontal plane you have to keep that movement or you have to always be touching that plane okay sagittal plane same thing sagittal is going to cut us into left and right you have to always be touching that transverse plane while well, touching to the top and bottom just remember that's rotation so frontal plane is where the movement goes through the axis is how the movement rotates. So that's why your like your axis, that's where the movement rotates about and the actual movement you see. In terms of the rest of the movements we'll look at, frontal plane will also be lateral flexion for the spine, lateral pelvic tilt for the pelvis, and For flexion extension, you have hip flexion extension, knee flexion extension, dorsiflexion, and that's with the foot, plantar flexion, which is the foot. So these are all the movements that we're going to have going forward here. Now, the one I'm not including in here is um, inversion and eversion, which is a foot and ankle movement. We'll cover that more when we get there, but that one really doesn't conform to this chart. It's one of like the only ones that's kind of on its own. So don't let that one confuse you. But these are the rest of the ones you'll have to know. So these are the movements that you'll need to know the rest of the class here. I guess I should say forward flexion of the spine or neck, extension of the spine or neck will fit in there too. All right, so there are all your movements that you have. So 
this will get you through the rest of the class or the rest of the course if you just remember this chart here. And now seeing as though that you can always have this as a reference because you don't have to be sitting in class, there's no reason why you guys shouldn't be able to at least always have this on hand to reference for yourselves. Just remember that the plane and its axis always go together. There are no exceptions to that. If you're in the frontal plane, you are always on the anterior posterior axis. If you're in the sagittal plane, you are always on the medial lateral axis. Transverse plane, always on the longitudinal axis. Those always go together without exception. There's no exceptions. And then here's our, what the movements do. Um, we'll keep going over this as they come up here. <clears throat> All right, so any questions on this movement stuff right here? Um, no. Okay, so on Wednesday, hopefully I'll have a, um, I guess somehow have a, a video for you or be able to be videoed for you because I don't have a webcam on my computer here. But um, we'll be going over the, uh, more of the movements of the knee and how to measure them, and then we'll kind of keep moving on from there. So that's everything new I have for you here for today. Um, like I said, on Wednesday, we'll get into more with the knee. Um, make sure you have your rough draft done by the end of the month here. Now, I'm going to just real quick edit this to give a slight bit of clarification. So for a credible source, it needs to have a DOI number. And what does that look like? Let me pull one up here. All right. See how this has a DOI number here? That is your, your, your DOI, it stands for Digital Object Identifier, but <clears throat> all re like academic research has a DOI number. So if you see a DOI, that means that it's credible. I know I'm very loosely using that term, but <clears throat> if it has a DOI, it means it's going to be higher quality. The way you're finding these, if you go into my park, and then go to your library, <clears throat> you're going to search for, oh, I don't know. Just throwing a term out there, human movement. And the source type you want to click on is academic journals. So that's the source type you want to click on here. The easiest for you is going to be full text. If you click on full text, that means that we have it available already. And then I would put your publication date 
to at least the year 2000, just because it'll get out a lot of the um, stuff here you don't really, that isn't relevant. But if you even look here, very first one, DOI number right there. DOI right here. So you see how that's all right there. <clears throat> if you click on the bit or the actual title and scroll down, it'll show you the DOI. Okay. As long as it has a DOI, that's what you need. If you even search for something Even if you're doing um, something like this, where you just search, do like a Google search or whatever. It's actually not going to work. You'd want to be searching for a journal article in your title. And that's going to give you the journals that you would go off of. So pretty much all these journals are going to be good for you. If you want to search directly for <clears throat> an individual article, I would do use the, the library because that'll get it right to where you need. And remember the things you want to check off, full text and academic journals. And then you want to change your publication date to at least the year 2000. <clears throat> You click full text because that will give you the full journal. You don't have then to worry about um, not having access to the full thing. But that's that. <clears throat> All right, so hopefully that helps you out a little bit there. But yeah, that's everything new I got for you here today. So thank you guys for showing up. Um, like I said, this will be available for you as soon as we're done here um, on the Zoom recordings. And then we'll pick up again on, um, on Wednesday here to finish up with the knee and possibly start into the foot and ankle. <clears throat> but yeah, that's everything new. So thank you guys for showing up again and I will see you all on Wednesday. Thank you.